Chapter four, colonial society. Though they had set themselves apart, the demand for European manufactured uh, goods grew alongside the colonies. A unique 18th century colonial style consumer revolution was spurred by class differences and the desire to demonstrate membership in the upper crust. The beginning of the industrial revolution in England created an economy for luxury goods just as American economic fortunes began to grow. Instead of making their own tools and clothes and utensils, colonists increasingly purchased luxury items made by specialized artisans and manufacturers abroad. Merchants and traders advertised their goods in colonial newspapers. Tea, glassware, cookery, and furniture soon became more common in colonial homes, and the idea of gentlemen and ladies came to be dominant features in American advertising. Beginning in the 1730s, a religious fervor swept through the colonies. Later called the Great Awakening, English evangelists, proponents of predestination, the idea that only certain people are bound to go to heaven, and open-air preachers like George Whitefield, let me write his name down, they traveled the countryside, quote, thundering against sin and for Jesus Christ, and revivals aimed at Christians who were asleep in their faith. These revivals attracted thousands of people. Some preachers appealed specifically to women and young, rootless sons. The idea of igniting a personal relationship with God appealed to those estranged from opportunity in colonial America, both in the North and South, touching off a schism between old light and new light Protestants in the New World. By way of Europe, the Enlightenment followed the Great Awakening and preached a very different message to the people of the colonies. That natural law and reason and science could create progress and advanced knowledge without the need for God. The Enlightenment drove interest in education, government, politics, and promoted a secular worldview that sometimes clashed with the message of the Great Awakening. The Enlightenment coincided with a number of human advances both in Europe and in the colonies. Advances in printing technology created cheap almanacs and Bibles, encouraging literacy in the colonies. The first American newspaper was published in Boston in the 1690s, and the popularity of so-called elopement notices in the paper of spurned love foretold a future committed to free press in the colonies. Colonial Massachusetts became the first place in the Western world to issue paper bills to be used as money. These notes, called bills of credit, were issued for finite periods of time on the colony's credit and varied in denomination. Formal schooling, rooted in religious tradition, became a cornerstone of early American life for boys. Those slaves and girls were only provided informal training and education. After 1700, nearly all American elites were being educated at American universities instead of established English or European colleges. Advances in science, including uh, smallpox inoculation, and technology, including theories of electricity, were early markers of an American commitment to the ideals of the Enlightenment. Despite the newfound commitment to education and science, African slavery was codified across the South when individual colonial assemblies began to pass slave codes that used skin color to mark status. Whites were universally free, as I mentioned. Blacks were permanent servant, uh, servants who inherited their parents' status. As the plantation system developed across southern colonies, slaves lived on increasingly large estates under the gang system of labor, working from dawn to dusk in groups with close supervision by a white overseer or an enslaved driver who could use physical force to compel labor in the fields. For American slaves and their families, the only legal way out of life of forced labor, as I mentioned, was death. Slave protests and efforts at rebellion were often muted but the Stono Rebellion of 1739 exists as evidence of a deep and undying desire for freedom. Most colonists proudly called themselves English subjects, even into the 1750s. By 1773, however, administrative changes in the royal enforcement of colonial policies and law brought differences between the English colonies and the English homeland to a head. English ties to the colonies remained loose, decentralized, and inefficient under King George I and II. As a result, colonial assemblies and the legislatures took up the business of limited self-government without a peep of English protest for the first 100 years of colonial life. The French and Indian War, sometimes called the Seven Years' War, 
in Europe upset the careful balance struck between the growing British Empire and the English colonies. By 1700, France controlled much of the interior of the American continent, including the Mississippi River and adjoining trade routes. The French and English powers coexisted on the continent until conflicts on the European continent, including King William's War, Queen Anne's War, and King George's War, sent colonial politics into a tailspin. Both sides, the French and the British, were continuously to ally themselves with different groups of natives on the American continent, knowing that conflicts for the continent would be inevitable. And they thought Native Americans on their side would help. The Iroquois Confederacy of five different Indian nations remained the continental power both sides believed they needed to gain the upper hand. In 1754, border tensions between the French and English eventually could set off the French and Indian War for control of the American continent. The war can be broken into three phases. First, French and Indian tribe allies launched assaults on Western English outposts where American colonists fought back without British help. Second, fighting stretched into the West Indies in Europe and into the colonies proper led by William Pitt, the British Secretary of State. The British impressed or forced colonists into military service to create colonial armies. They seized colonial food and weapons, and they quartered British troops in colonial homes with no promise of reimbursement, creating domestic friction that almost brought the English war effort to a halt. Third, William Pitt reversed the most obnoxious policies of the British, and the French and their Indian allies were unable to sustain their progress, with a mostly united military eventually and colonists firmly against the French. At the, Par uh, at the Peace of Paris, Peace of Paris, 1763, the French ceded their continental claims. The victorious British, deeply in debt and unhappy with the colonial effort during the war, decided to take a larger role in organizing and controlling the colonies henceforth for the first time in a century. Some English colonists who had for the first time acted in concert as united colonies during the French and Indian War remained bitter themselves over British authority seized during the war. And they began to move to separate themselves from Europe and to a de uh, greater degree, England. The French and Indian War was a disaster for American natives, even those who had aligned with the British. The English regarded their native allies as too passive during the war and whatever relationship they had, uh, they had was shattered by later fighting uh, over the Ohio Valley. Relationships between colonists and Native Americans still grew more hostile. In 1761, Neolin, a prophet, received a vision from his religion's main deity known as the Master of Life. The Master of Life told Neolin that the only way to enter heaven would be to cast off the corrupting influence of Europe by expelling the British from Indian country. He preached the avoidance of alcohol, a return to traditional rituals, and a pan-Indian identity to his disciples, including Pontiac, an Ottawa leader. Pontiac took Neolin's words to heart and sparked what would become later known as Pontiac's War. At its height, his pan-Indian uprising including native peoples from the territory between the Great Lakes, the Appala Appalachians, the Mississippi, uh, and the Mississippi River Valley. Native American warriors attacked British forts and frontier settlements, killing as many as 400 British soldiers and 2,000 settlers. Disease and a shortage of supplies ultimately undermined the Indian war effort. Though the Western Indians did not win Pontiac's war, they succeeded in fundamentally altering the British government's Indian policy. The war made British officials recognize that peace in the West would require royal protection of Indian lands and heavy-handed regulation of Anglo-American or colonial trade activity in Indian country. During the war, the British Crown issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which created the proclamation line marking the Appalachian Mountains as the uncrossable boundary between Indian country and the British colonies. The effects of Pontiac's war were substantial and widespread. The war proved that coercion was not an effective strategy for imperial control, though the British government would continue to employ the strategy to try to consolidate their power in North America, most notably through various acts imposed upon the colonies. Additionally, the prohibition of Anglo-American settlement in Indian country, especially in the Ohio River Valley, sparked discontent among Western colonists.
the French immigrant Provencer articulated this discontent most clearly in his 1782 letters from an American farmer when he asked, what then is the American, this new man? In other words, why did colonists start thinking of themselves as Americans, not Britons? Provencer suggested that America was a melting pot of self-reliant individual landholders, fiercely independent in pursuit of their own interests and free from the burdens of the old European class system. It was an answer many wanted to hear and fit with self-conceptions of the new nation, albeit one that imagined itself as white, male, and Protestant. By 1763, Americans had never been more united. They fought and they celebrated together, but they also recognized that they were not considered full British citizens and that they were considered something else. Americans across the colonies viewed imperial reforms as threats to the British liberties they saw as their birthright. The Stamp Act Congress of 1765 brought colonial leaders together in an unprecedented show of cooperation against duties or taxes on tea, molasses, and, and stamps, just general taxes on, on transactions imposed by the British Parliament and popular boycotts of British goods created a common narrative of sacrifice, resistance, and a shared political identity new on the globe colonial rebellion would now be plot.